Hello, I'm Dylan. Now I'm Keon. This is Trash It Off to that podcast where, you know what, maybe it is the fixture because this week we watch Dinosaurs on a Spaceship. Written by Chris Chibnall. Directed by Sam Metstein. And air on September 8th, 2012. Or 2012. 2012. The, world, the, the year the world was supposed to end according to the Mayan calendar. But, but the, it didn't. Or maybe it did and we're just living in purgatory right now. <laughs> Or maybe some other, like, I don't know, revolutionary thing happened and just no one noticed. Our punishment is to make podcasts <laughs> for all eternity. <laughs> Can you imagine? We make podcasts until we die, and then we go to purgatory where God's like, you're going to be making podcasts for the rest of all time. Just because well, either, either one, you guys are really good at podcasts and God really likes it. Or two, we, we're just terrible people. And our punishment <laughs> is to make podcasts forever. One of the two. Well, it doesn't matter whether we do this until we die or stop, because if we stop, we die. <laughs> I keep forgetting how complex the Trust Your Doctor lore is getting. <laughs> we haven't referenced to Ghana in a while, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so if it wasn't immediately obvious, this episode's uh, inspired by Snakes on a Plane. Yeah, they just really one-upped Snakes on a Plane, you know. Snake, well, they kind of did. What's the one-up I mean, of concept. snakes? Well, dinosaurs. And what's the one-up of planes? Spaceships. Is the one up from a plane really a spaceship? That's the question. Like, what's the tier ranking for modes of the, transportation? I think, I think the snake to dinosaur <laughs> jump is a little bit more questionable, honestly. But, I mean, you know. dinosaurs were... I was going to say dinosaurs were reptiles, but actually dinosaurs were... Birds. They're yeah. like ancient birds. Yeah. They're birds before birds were cool. They're like this, I watched this, I don't know what it was from. It was like Discovery Channel or like National Geographic about, it was like this probably 45 minute episode of something about like how whales evolved from wolf-like creatures. What? Or whatever. Yeah, because whales are mammals. Yeah, I knew that. And the, the whole thing was just about how like these things that were probably similar to wolves just started spending more and more time in the water. And now we have whales. It must really suck to be a baby whale, you know, because, like, every other species... Because, like, your species is dying. <laughs> well, that. <laughs> <laughs> and humans are killing you. Uh, but also, like, every other species, like, you get born, and then your parents raise you, and then you got to do, like, whatever your species is, is known for, right? If you're a baby bird, you, you chill in the nest for, like, a couple yeah, months before yeah. you go to fly. A whale is just, like, you get pooped out, and it's like, well, you got to swim now. <laughs> Does it literally throw you in the deep end, like... <laughs> You come on out and it's like, all right, you're well, on survival I mean, they mode. They can handle it. Like, well, they clearly can they can it. because whales have survived thousands of years. The one thing whales can't handle is freaking harpoons. <laughs> <laughs> Bastard whalers. <clears throat> anyway. Well, I mean, look, if the whales are so great, why didn't they evolve to, to withstand the harpoons, you know? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> wow, great. The why didn't animals evolve to to withstand human <laughs> human hunting hunting theory. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Chibnall wrote up the script. He's like, alright, dinosaurs on a spaceship. I can do that. Uh Moffat wanted him to use t- these two robot props that apparently were designed for a a different television yeah, program. Yeah, show. I forgot what it's called. Like Destination 2100 or something like that. Um, but they I apparently touch them up. They aren't the. Ex- they don't look exactly the same, thankfully. <laughs> Why thankfully? It's not like we're going to ever watch Destination 2100. Yeah, but it's I don't not know. like it's Destination just... 2100 or, or whatever it was called actually like got remembered by the public consciousness since <laughs> how many people know <laughs> this show even existed. <laughs> yeah. True. Even though this was only six years ago now. Yeah, crazy. And he he wrote up this script, and and Moffat suggested a lot of uh, changes to the script during the scripting process. Some of which made it into the script, some of which didn't. Uh, the reason why Nef- uh, Nefertiti shows up in this is because Chibnall was like, "Well, she disappears from from history." So I like to imagine she just went traveling off with the doctor. Turns yeah. out she gets dumped yeah. with John Riddell in the yeah. African wilderness. Yeah, I, I read that explanation <laughs> and like I had a pretty big problem with the with Nefertiti and Riddell being in this. I was like, wow, that's your explanation behind it, eh? Uh, I like Nefertiti. Riddell, uh, Riddell was like... Well, Riddell's, Riddell's inclusion... Sure why Riddell's here. This was originally supposed to be, I forget, Buffalo... Not Bill. Buffalo John. Buffalo or something John, like that. Yeah. Some the guy, guy who saved the historically, buffalo. Historically, like... Saved. I mean, I'm sure this wasn't like one 
a one guy, right, but like historically was involved with saving the North American uh, buffalo. Right. Um, Because if you didn't know, they were on the verge of extinction, but they were brought back. But then Moffat was like, it's it's too close to my story for next week. Right, right, right. Which is um, a town called Mercy. A town called Mercy, which is like a space themed Western, as far as the the preview indicates. Also, pretty bad. (laughs) It looks. It looks pretty good. Don't get your hopes up. I thought that too the first time I saw it. <laughs> um, but yeah, Moffat was like, it's too similar to this character, so we need to change it up. So they decided to include a big game hunter. Yeah, apparently he's inspired by Alan Quatermain from H. Ryder Haggard's <clears throat> stories like King Solomon's Mines, which I've actually read. King Solomon's Mines was pretty good. Yeah, there's a character named Solomon in this. Right. Kind of playing again into that the King Solomon's Mines thing. I mean, there was going to be this explanation that Riddell is there because the Doctor like owes him one because Riddell saved his life, and well, apparently there, Riddell there is going to die like, the day after he gets picked up by the Doctor. There is that brief like exposition <laughs> thing where you get that they have some background, but they don't go too much into it, which is which fine. Is I mean, yeah. kind of like that. Yeah, there's this mysterious character who just knows the Doctor and's like, "What's up? I'm a big game hunter. <laughs> the guy who plays him plays Lestrade in Sherlock, so that's kind of fun." In the sense that I recognized him and was like, damn, where do I recognize him from? And then I had to go on IMDb <laughs> to find out. But fun nonetheless. Yeah, I just questioned the decision to like include a big game hunter in this dinosaur story. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as that's like, the thing. As one of the, you know, people trying to save the dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, that's the thing. Is like, it's a little weird. Especially since the dinosaurs are extinct, Especially and then you bring this guy who likes hunting, and he's like, I want a dinosaur to Well, in theory, he's doing the same thing as Solomon. Right. <laughs> right. It's just circumstances have, have made it's, it that it, they're it, on opposite <laughs> sides of the, the battle. <laughs> it's a little weird. <laughs> yeah. It's very weird. Yeah. Actually. Kind of, you know, I really liked 42. I still think 42, I'd still put 42 as my, as my favorite episode of the new mm-hmm. Doctor Who series. Uh, but this episode doesn't give me hope for, like, the 13th Doctor and, and Chris Chibnall. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I like just... I just, and- I, I just think it was uh, over overcrowded. I think bringing Amy and Rory into it as well as actually where it fell apart, like, I think Nefertiti and Riddell would have worked fine without yeah, that's, Amy and Rory. Yeah, that's one of my things that I was going to talk about. But since we bring it up now, I was definitely going to bring up, you know, I think this would have worked with... Either Amy, Rory, and um, Rory's dad, whatever his name was. <laughs> Brian. Brian. and or, or Nefertiti and Riddell. Not both of those groups. Yeah, that's where the story kind of falters for me. Uh, definitely. But, well, yeah, we'll, we'll get there in a sec, basically. Especially because, and this is also uh, sort of production-esque, is that Moffat, um, for this season, wanted to go for... Uh, you know, showing the aftermath of of you know what a, what a companion's life is like after the doctor travels with them. Yeah, I, I think I, they're doing a pretty good job with that with Amy and Rory. I mean, once we get to the resolution of this plotline, I I really question the inclusion of Amy and Rory in the first five episodes of the season, <laughs> like a lot. Like I feel like the ride out was fine in you know God Complex, and yeah. then we see them show up yeah, again. I agree. At the end of the season, you know, when we get the resolution. Let him go, Moffat. I mean, no, really, though, because, like, this whole five-episode span is, like, well, why? Yeah, they didn't need to be in last week's story. Especially like, since, especially since you know, Moffat really explores that companion who doesn't travel full-time in the TARDIS with his next two companions. Like, both of them go through that same plot thread where they don't travel full-time and the Doctor shows up, picks them up, takes them on a journey, and then drops them back off at home so you know that coupled with the fact that amy and roy got like a decent ride out of the end of series six is like it's just like why did they have to be in these five episodes but i'm gonna save that discussion for when we get to that extremely underwhelming ride out but yeah so i mean the story starts with the doctor traveling alone again uh, well it starts with him with nefertiti and he's like hey yeah, well, as with Riddell, there's some indication that they have some history, some very recent history. Which is, I mean, it's always fun to hear the Doctor just casually name drop, like, famous people in history, and you're like... Yeah, but... He does I it mean, again but, in this episode. It's yeah. actually something that, I guess, Chibnall himself really likes, because the 13th Doctor does it, like, five episodes in a row. <laughs> well, I mean, I like that kind of thing, but 
when it comes to actually having that character in the story, I don't know. It just feels like I think it works for Nefertiti because she, she, you know, historically she disappears. Yeah, I guess. But it also it has that like hint of well, look how wacky and weird we are, and look, he's traveling with all these people from history and taking them <laughs> out of time. And yeah, I don't know. It's like the bananas line that Moffat, you know, used to like to write in. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess you can look at it that way. And I do. I do look at it that way. And that's perfectly all right. Nefertiti is traveling with the Doctor in this story. My understanding was that they hadn't, like, traveled anywhere prior. They just kind of had a history. Yeah. Uh, He picks up Riddell as well from the African wilderness. Riddell only wants to come along when the Doctor says he has no idea what's going on. Because the thing is, the Doctor, after leaving Nefertiti... Well, actually, takes he takes Nefertiti and he meets up in like the twenty fourth century with the Indian Space Agency, which right. is apparently a a major power now. Right. And they're and like there's, there's, there's an a spaceship. unidentified ship. They say it's the size of Canada and it's approaching Earth. They're just like if it gets too close, we're just going to blow it up. The Doctor's like, well, why would you do that? And I'm like, well, we can't communicate with it. And the Doctor's like, hang on, I got this. Kind of interesting that they decided to make the Indian Space Agency the major power here i like it because i think it brings some diversity to the show and it's not like britain is the world power every decade ever in doctor who right? yeah it's just a, a a former colony of britain yeah that's the other thing <laughs> i mean but india actually has like a pretty prolific space agency now they're one of the like half a dozen to a dozen countries that have launched their own satellites so that puts them in a pretty upper echelon already yeah yeah no i mean and I mean, many people do theorize, actually, that India is going to be one of those people that starts to rival the European Space people. Agency in the next couple of years. Classic yeah. space pundits, I guess. <laughs> <clears throat> but anyway, the Doctor really is upset at this because he's like, you're destroying something. You don't even know what it is. Kind of th- yeah, he, he likes to know what he's destroying, as the end of this episode indicates. <laughs> <laughs> kind of reminded me of uh, Christmas Invasion. <laughs> yeah, with the, with the um, Sikorax. Sikorax, yeah. Where Harriet Jones just blows them up and the Doctor's like, you didn't have to do that. And it removes her from power. Yeah, but I mean, also calls to mind that no second chances line, uh, but really mm. one-ups that and turns it into no first chances. <laughs> yeah, no first chances. <laughs> you blow it up. You're on my hit list, my bad list. The Doctor goes also to pick up Amy and Rory. And Amy and Roy are like, no, not now, not now, because their da- uh, Rory's dad they're, is there changing a light bulb. Yeah, they're, <laughs> he's changing this light bulb, and both Amy and Rory are, like, footing the ladder or whatever, and you get the idea from how it's shot that it's, like, it's pretty tall or whatever, but then, like, you get the full shot of it, and it's literally just, like, I don't know, it's a five-foot like ladder. ladder. Yeah. <laughs> His name is Brian Williams. Yeah. Not to the, be confused with that news anchor, Brian Williams. <laughs> I don't even know who that is, but Sure. The actor who plays him is his name uh, like Mark, Mark Williams, Mark, yeah, I think something like that. Mike, Mike, what? Yeah, Mark Williams, Mike Williams. Interesting, interesting. Doctor uh, Williams calls is him a pretty, Pond later. Yeah, yeah. Williams is a pretty common last name, though. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not like they were going way out on a limb when they named a character Rory Williams. You know, <laughs> I mean, Rory, Rory is a pretty Rory's not a common name, but Williams is a pretty common surname. Yeah, yeah. And this, okay, this is anecdotal, I guess, but I was watching, I wasn't watching this with my mother, but she was in the room at the <laughs> same time. And uh, she was, she just happened to look at the screen. She was like, oh, that's that guy from Harry Potter. And I was like, well, like, yeah, no, it's you're... Arthur Weasley. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, no, it's not like, no, it's not like, it's, it's, what are you, what are you talking about? Like not every British actor was in Harry Potter. And I looked it up and this guy was Ron's dad. Yeah. Arthur. Yeah. Arthur Weasley. Yeah. Like, I don't know how you would even remember <laughs> that though. I feel like he has a pretty recognizable face. Your mom clearly recognized yeah, him. Yeah, but like, and I don't know. I don't know. For someone who's you know, only watched Harry Potter you and be like, well, once your mom, 10 years ago. <laughs> your mom is the, the, the greatest doctor, Harry Potter fan in existence, right? But what if she is? No, no. <laughs> <She's> <laughs> just... <laughs> what if she is? You're right. You no, got but... me there. Zing. Got him. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. I, w- I wonder if this guy like only plays father characters. 
Because, like, the two roles I know him as are dads, so that's a pretty big I don't I'm think kidding. so. I'm kidding. <laughs> I don't think so. But no, yeah. I, I don't think so either. The doctor's like, how did you get in the TARDIS? And Rory's like, that's, a, that's my dad, and you and materialized, materialized the TARDIS around us. around us. And the doctor keeps forgetting this. <clears throat> or just like, Which is weird. Yeah. Well, yeah, he's a bigger fish to fry. He's a bigger... Bigger dinosaurs to yeah. boil. <laughs> I wonder what dinosaurs tasted like. Like chicken. That's your question. Yeah. If Jurassic Park was real, you wouldn't be like, what are the, the socioeconomic moral <laughs> implications of this? You'd be like, man, I really wonder what the dinosaur tastes like. <laughs> Licking your lips. You sill. <laughs> <laughs> I totally forgot about that. Man, Doctor Who was full of some weird <laughs> nonsense. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it was. Oh, man. Still looking forward to that frog. Still have no idea what that's about. So, <laughs> they all pile out of the TARDIS onto the spaceship. The, the ship. The ship looks get really named, cool. But it, looks, it looks almost like... A catacomb? To me. It's kind of made of stone... Oh, you mean the outside? Yeah, yeah, the outside. No, there's, there's. It reminds me of something from from a, a science fiction show or movie. And I'm forgetting what it is, but it also reminds me of this four dimensional Rubik's cube that you can. It's, yeah, yeah. Have you seen that? Yeah, yeah. That you can download online. And yeah. Then you... <laughs> and like mess around with for two seconds before you realize you have no idea what you're looking at. <laughs> before you realize you don't even know how to solve a three dimensional Rubik's <laughs> yeah. cube. Yeah. Would a two dimensional Rubik's cube be? It wouldn't be a cube. I mean, be a square. Maybe, yeah. Would it be those like slidey puzzles where you have the one hole and you gotta like <laughs> those number puzzles? Slide it around to like complete the picture or put the tiles in order. Might be a two I, I, I two cubics square. I guess. Yeah, it looks. You know, I know what you're talking about when it reminds you of something else in science fiction, and I also know what you're talking about when you don't remember what it is because because I, I don't remember what it is either. Yeah, I mean, given how much science fiction I've watched, it's probably something really famous because, you know, it's not it's not a lot that I've watched. But, yeah, I don't remember what it is. Oh, well. The, uh, inside, the inside looks, looks kind of like a, like a catacomb. It's yeah. kind of stone. I mean, it's it's Doctor Who corridors, right? But I, I liked it because, you know, there were a couple of different... Well, there was the, the beach. There's sort of a large landscape because the thing is the size of Canada, so... I mean, it's kind of cool because it's, you know, made of stone. It looks like it's made of stone. Which, you know, a stone spaceship. Yeah, I mean, it, it already, like, visually it indicates the Silurians, which are revealed to be in this, like, halfway through. Right. Or, like, not in... The, well, there's one Silurian on video there's recording. one Silurian. But, like, played by the guy who played Maloke. <laughs> and this Silurian's name is, like... Uh, I don't remember what it was now, but it's also a reference to a classic series writer, and it's a reference to Barry Letts. Oh, wow. Uh, Blaytal. All right. I mean, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's like how Malachi is supposed yeah. to be a reference to Malcolm yeah. Hulk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so the, the, the Doctor and Co. will kind of just run around for a bit, and we see a mysterious voice from the shadows like, ah, Doctor, finally. And you're like, it's going to be the monster. But no, it's... it's right, because the, um, there's someone watching them um, on recording or whatever, and, and Rory s- says Doctor, and he's like, yes, Doctor. Finally. Right, and they get separated. There are teleports on the ship that seem to just go off randomly. <laughs> and, <laughs> well, I think the doctor accidentally activates it, like looking at the screen, and it teleports him, Rory, and Brian to a beach somewhere. Right. And and Brian is freaking out. He doesn't know what's going on. And Rory's like, look, just go with it. Look, we're in Bad Wolf Bay. This is a typical thing to have happen. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, it looks like Bad Wolf Bay again. <laughs> Haunting the show. Let it go, Moffat. <laughs> Yeah, forget Rose or, you know, Amy. Or you really, what they really have to let go is Bad Wolf Bay. <laughs> the doctor tells them to start digging, and Brian just pulls out a trowel. <laughs> Rory's like, you just carry that? Brian's like, you don't? And some, this is where some of the dialogue got kind of, I don't know, just odd. It was like, I don't know, it felt very stilted and strange, especially, you know, jumping forward a little bit, that line where 
um, Brian gets shot in the shoulder, and Rory's like, some people collect car memorabilia wherever they go, and but well, I that's, collect that's medical a, that's supplies. That's supposed to be a funny line about how Brian carries a trowel around, because he's like, well, I'm a gardener, so I carry a trowel around, and then Rory says, like, well, you carry gardening equipment around, I carry medical equipment. I know, but the way he delivers it, he's like, for me, it's medical supplies. All right, but like... <laughs> And it's just like oh, I didn't have a problem with it, honestly. I, I did, and some of Amy's lines. I don't. I'm not even remembering exact. Instances. I don't even remember anything Amy said in the story because I was just so focused on the great bromance between the Doctor and Brian. <laughs> and but that's also the thing <clears throat> is let's just touch on this now. You know the the scenes with Amy like looking up the stuff in the computer or whatever. They're completely inconsequential. No, but well, like Nefertiti and Riddell's character, I think don't, don't have, even have to be like there. I mean, those whole scenes are inconsequential. The only thing they find out is that the Silurians are there, and they tell the Doctor, and and and, and that's it. That's uh, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, what, this, that's, that's what this that's where the scene is. But like, I don't know. It just one of those groups could have could have been totally missing from the episode, and it would have worked out for the better. I think. Obviously, there would have had to been changes. But yeah, but I mean, I like the the Doctor going off to the beach because he reveals that they've got hydro engines, and, and that's why they can't just shut the engines down to prevent the missiles from coming, because it's like, it takes a really long time to shut these things down. Yeah, no, I mean, I I, I like all the, you know, going to the different parts of the ship, <clears throat> like Solomon's uh, little pod, medical bay or whatever, and going to the beach and stuff, but I just feel like I, either Amy, Rory, and, and Brian could have been not in this, or Nefertiti and Riddell. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I agree. I think the story gets overstuffed with characters and, and then none of them get anything except for Brian. <laughs> well, Brian is, is digging on the beach and there's some some things that mm. look like birds flying around. He's like, are those kestrels? Kestrels or whatever yeah. it's called? Yeah. And the doc's like, those are kestrels, those are pterodons. He says pterodactyls, but then some, I don't know, I imagine some nerd on the wiki had to be like, those aren't pter- pterodactyls, those are pterodons, which wow. are closely related wow. but slightly different species. And I'm like, who cares? <laughs> Who cares? Just edit it out, honestly. No, I'm kidding. Who cares? I mean, obviously that guy cared enough to enough to care. I guess. <laughs> the Doctor Who wiki is the most pedantic wiki I've ever seen. So if there's one thing we're allowed to make fun of on this show is the... <laughs> the Doctor Who wiki? The, yeah. <laughs> uh, but they're <clears throat> swooping down, coming in for their kill, coming in for their, their meal. What do they eat? I don't know. This is my, my question on this. What do these dinosaurs eat that have kept them alive for literally thousands of years? Well, they probably have a bunch of landscape areas, you know, like the but beach. But not all of them are, are no, herbivores. Not all of them are there. Yeah, you know, I don't know. Maybe they just started an entire ecosystem. Maybe they're like, hey. Well. <clears throat> the Silurians built a whole <laughs> ecosystem into their spaceship. Maybe. I mean, I guess the Silurians were alive, like, right up until, like, a couple days ago, so they probably fed the dinosaurs, I guess, now that I think about it. No, yeah, they, no, were in, well, it they were actually, I mean, they were in stasis. No, yeah, Never mind. It wasn't days. It was, like, probably no, thousands it was, of... No, it was days ago that they were alive, though, because Solomon says that when he arrived, he had the robots wake them up and then just airlock them. Yeah, but we don't know when that, like, was. Okay, but I'm assuming Solomon doesn't live for, like, hundreds of years. Well, maybe it wasn't hundreds of years, but it doesn't mean it has to be days. It could be, like, All right, I mean, I, I guess it could be, like, a year tops. But I don't know if Solomon would survive with the freaking hole in his I mean, leg for that we, long. We, we can't be 100% sure, but, I, I mean, the Silurians had been there for, like, thousands of years yeah. on the ship. Yeah, but yeah. in stasis. Yeah. I don't know. I just want to know what these dinosaurs ate. Triceratops seems pretty starving if it's going after like grass residue on a golf ball. <laughs> Which, <laughs> so the doc, I mean, the doctor and, and Rory and, and um, Brian, Brian, well, the doctor figures out that they're still on the ship because he, he, there's like a panel on, on one of the rocks. Yeah. <laughs> well, also because they find a floor underneath the beach. Yeah. Like two yeah. inches down. <laughs> And they're like, well, and, uh, they yeah they, they, they go, go into cave, some caves to escape the which the just pterodons. leads back into the to the the ship the main body of the ship I guess and they're confronted by these two robots who have some you know sort of funny banter between them yeah they're supposed to be humorous yeah I really I like the design you know they're they're sort of imported from this other show 
and they they look slightly different from one another. They look mm-hmm. really cool, I think. They reminded me of a robot we see later on, which actually, now that I'm thinking about it, later on they might just reuse these props. <laughs> now that I really think about it, yeah. Well, you know why not? They're they're really good props. And I mean, they're well made. They're really really well painted and designed. Yeah. And they're well acted too. I mean, I don't know if these are like guys in suits. I'm pretty sure I assume just, they are. Maybe well, they, we don't know. We, 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 we don't, don't know, know for but, sure if the voice is the same as the operator. Yeah, of course. Could be. Could just look it up. Probably should have looked it up. Like, <clears throat> just trust your doctor for you. <laughs> and they're brought. They're brought into the 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 corridors or whatever. They're brought to this sort of like the, sick bay. Or they meet yeah. so, this guy named Solomon. Well, the doctor meets him. Yeah, because Rory and, like you can and fix Brian me. are locked out. I arrived here. And then the doctor gets scanned. He's like, what's that? And Solomon's like, uh, a technical malfunction. <laughs> and well, Solomon reveals also that he brought the doctor there because he thought he was a doctor. The doctor's like, oh, well, he doctor, didn't bring doctor. the doctor there. But well, like, like he... To a ship. Yeah, not to yeah. a ship, but like... Not to the ship, but to Solomon's ship docked on the side of the main ship. Yeah. And the doctor's like, well, I mean, I guess I can fix you, but... I don't, I don't really want, don't to. want to. Because Solomon's like not a great guy. <laughs> and then Solomon's like, all right, he calls up his robots like, injure the older one. And they shoot him in the shoulder. And the doctor's like, all right, well, I don't respond well to violence, so I'll fix you up. But I mean, you're going to regret that. Solomon's like, yeah, yeah, we'll <laughs> and, see. And he does pretty soon. This guy's like 20 minutes left of life or like an hour. <laughs> meanwhile, Amy and Co. are messing around with the computers. Riddell says some casually sexist things. Well, okay, this is something I want to touch on. There are uh, plenty of sexual innuendos in this story, like more than usual. And it also make, this also makes me <clears throat> worried for the Chibnall era. Oh, no, that, that doesn't appear to you in the Chibnall era. I'll just tell you that right now. All right, good. No, I'm being, I'm being good. dead serious. That's okay, like, yeah, good. Because they're all throughout this episode. But these weird, this, like, Riddell is, like, casually sexist, which... I mean, he's from the 1920s, so I, I, I 1902. guess. 1902. 1902, actually, so a, yeah, I there's guess. There's a strange, like... That makes sense. There's a strange, like, I don't know what you would call it, like, word overlay or, like, location and date yeah. information. But yeah. it's done. It's not, like, a typical, you know, bottom left corner or whatever. It's, like, in the sky, and it's yeah, a it's strange like font. Yeah, CG'd into the scene, almost. Yeah. Like, yeah. it's there. Yeah. Like they do on Naked and Afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Discovery Channel TV show. But yeah, Riddell makes these like casually sexist remarks about how Amy and Nefertiti like aren't competent, and Amy's like, well, "I'm easily worth like five of you." And Nefertiti's like, "I basically ruled without a king for for a long time. People bow to me." And Riddell's like, "All right." They also take some shots at like big game hunters. Riddell, which they should. <laughs> yeah, which they should. <laughs> Riddell and Nefertiti start flirting, and Amy's like, "Oh God, please no." And unfortunately for her, that continues. <laughs> yeah. But they look up information on the computers, and this is kind of like silence um, in the library. Where, sort of. Where there used to be, you know, they look at a diagram from, you know, ages ago, and there used to be uh, dozens or probably thousands of life signals. And But the, the diagram today isn't showing, you know, very many at all, except this one, you know, blip. Right, the, the, the doctor, the Amy... Amy overlays or has the computer display side by side the life signs at launch and the life signs now. She's like, what's the difference here? And Nefertiti's like, look, that ship right there docked on the side. And he's like, well, how did you spot that? But Because it's blinking red while the other ones are like solid green and it's pretty easy to see. <laughs> yeah, kind of makes you wonder why they didn't spot it sooner. This is better solid like five minutes just staring at this diagram and like, what's the difference? <laughs> One of these things. Riddell's is not a big like game hunter where One eyesight is like eyesight is like a major, major. Riddell probably doesn't even know requirement. what he's looking at. <laughs> I mean, he just kind of <laughs> goes along with all this for a guy from 1902. Nefertiti just goes along with this for someone like before the invention yeah. of like electricity <laughs> or even like the flushable for, like, toilet. Glass. <laughs> yeah, of <laughs> glass. Have, like... <laughs> yeah. I don't know why I went for glass, but I mean, just seems, <laughs> glass seems very ancient, and I don't. I don't think the ancient before Egyptians the invention had glass. of sliced bread. <laughs> I think I sl- Riddell was before the invention of sliced bread too. <laughs> I like how the toaster was invented before sliced bread. You had to slice your own bread to toast it. Then they're like, "What if we just pre-slice the bread?" 
Yeah, you know, the more I think about it, the more that expression... Doesn't uh, make sense? No, the more the, the sliced bread expression is actually completely true. Because, like, imagine if sliced bread didn't exist and you just had to slice your own bread every time. Yeah, what about it? I have to do that all the time. With, you have to do that all the time the with baguettes. I know, but it would be a pain in the neck. Not really. I think it's, it would. It's really not that. It's really th- not that big of a pain. I, I, you I just, think just it pull would. out the knife and <laughs> it's like sub one minute here. Yeah, but <laughs> like that adds it's, up. It's, it it's adds like up. a it's like a sub minute long. No, but yeah, no. no. What? <laughs> yeah, no. 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 <laughs> what do you buy canned bread too? <laughs> Maybe what on it? I'm just kidding. <laughs> Can't be bothered to take all that space to use a bread loaf. I'll like store it in a can. You know, sometimes I've been too lazy to even make a sandwich, so I just like take out the individual parts and just eat them separately. I'm not sure if you're being serious or not. No, I am. Okay. Sometimes I'm too lazy to make a sandwich. I just toast two pieces of bread and then just shove some cheese in the middle. <laughs> that's, that's, that's it. I mean, it's like it's a it's the bare minimum required <laughs> to be a sandwich. That British classic, you know, bread sandwich. <laughs> anyway, bread sandwich would be a lot more satisfying to make if you didn't have pre-sliced bread because you'd have to like <laughs> s- slice the bread and and, and stuff. <laughs> Anyway. The doctor um, fixes Solomon and then is like, look, I basically Solomon reveals he's got an IV system, which is an information wait, and value wait a system. Minute. We completely skip the part where they meet the Stegosaurus, which is Stegosaurus. like a big reveal what, of the dinosaurs. Where revealed that it's dinosaurs on the yeah. spaceship. Yeah. They come out of the elevator. They get chased. That entire scene was awesome, especially because they used the one of the – or the the guy who designed like the dinosaur movement or whatever, or was responsible mm-hmm. for a huge part of it at least, was a, a, a trained Jim Henson dude. Which is why the dinosaurs, I guess, look pretty cool. Yeah, I mean they did it with a mix of CG and and practical effects. The sleeping T Rex was obviously a practical effect that Riddell steps yeah. over. Yeah, we we skipped that too, but I want to touch on on like the logistics of of that. At the end, okay. Some of the dinosaur-like biology in this is is uh, interesting. Is perfect. Least. Interesting to say the least. But Where anyway. do these dinosaurs do their business? Where do these dinosaurs procreate? This might be the greatest like engineering problem that's been solved by this spaceship well, ever on Doctor place, Who, and we're just brushing it aside. The, the, the thing is as big as Canada. There's right. enough room. <laughs> they right. only visit minuscule parts of the ship. But what's the what's the mechanics behind all this? How do they get the dinosaurs on the damn spaceship? This is the biggest engineering question of the whole show. How do they get the dinosaurs on this well, thing? Well, they equate it to, to the Ark, right? Like Noah's Ark, where they brought two of each yeah. creature. They call it the Silurian Ark. But... Right, and that seemed pretty you know, feasible. So it makes sense that this would as well. I mean, the Silurian... Maybe they just had God on their side. Whatever. Black. Mentions that they were able to get all Blay-tall. the uh, Blaytol, Beta on whatever it was, whatever Blaytech mentions that they got all the dinosaurs on except for like one species. And you kind of have to wonder which species they left off. Which species was just like, well, damn. <laughs> <laughs> the ones that evolved into birds, Archaeopteryx, right? I mean, they only they didn't take every yeah, no, they dinosaur didn't take though. Them, but like, could have just gone with the joke. <laughs> no. <laughs> so the doctor gets scanned by the IV system, and Solomon's like, "Wow, you're worth literally nothing. You're not even in the system." And the doctor's like, "Yeah." Yeah, because Solomon has this system. Solomon was uh, apparently I forget if it was Chibnall or Moffat who said this, because Moffat made some inputs into the story, like we mentioned. But Solomon was sort of based on um, Somali pirates. Yeah, I think Chibnall said that. Yeah. So he has this computer system that can just put a price on anything but the doctor's not in it really anything. so i guess the doctor actually has been doing a pretty good job of keeping a low profile yeah again right up until that that gets completely <laughs> like till someone later in the season just points out something that once it's points out you're like wow that's actually really obvious why didn't i think of that before so the doctor's like yeah well not worth anything that's me but then somehow Solomon scans everything on the ship and finds Nefertiti, and he's like, well, she's worth more than all the dinosaurs on the ship combined. Right, and I, f- I forget if it's now. I think it is, but the doctor 
figures out why they're on a course to Earth because Solomon obviously isn't from Earth, right? And he needs to get back to wherever he's from. Uh, but there, the the thing is, the Silurian ship. I forget exactly what this was. I think it's like once hijacked, its its direction was to just set course back to Earth or something like that. Well, they were planning to bring it back to Earth anyway, so that's why it's returning. It's just continued along its regular path, I think. But the thing is that Solomon couldn't course correct because he killed all the Silurians. So yeah, he's yeah, like, yeah. well... <laughs> was it that? There was some, like, I don't know. I seem to remember some, like, th- explanation as to why it's coming back to Earth, but, you know, I don't necessarily remember. But it is, and Solomon can't change its its course. Yeah. So he's just kind of stuck there. Injured. The but doctor like, fixes him up. Yeah. The doctor's, well, he's left now with <clears throat> Rory and Brian. He's like, well, what are we going to do? And they, they end up finding Amy Riddell and Nefertiti. Yeah, they, they escape on the Triceratops. Yeah, which, which is, this is a dumb scene. They just kind of get on the Triceratops and the robots are shooting at them while they're just sitting there because the Triceratops isn't moving. And I'm like, these freaking the stormtroopers, <laughs> like... Yeah, and the, the way they get the Triceratops, because the Triceratops was, was introduced earlier and it uh, is probably starving because it reacts in a hungry way to the, the golf balls that, are, uh, that Brian has, right. which have like grass residue on them. <laughs> um, so the way they get it to move is Brian throws the golf balls and then just sort of chases after them. The, it, it behaves like, I mean, they, 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 they have it behave like a dog, right? Where it like fetches the thing and, you know. It woof, woof, boys. <laughs> Yeah, there's some dinosaur roars in this, and I know we've like mentioned this before, but like, what did dinosaurs really sound like, right? I don't know. No, me neither. Nobody knows. Probably sound like what baby birds do. <laughs> <laughs> They're probably like pretty pretty bird like. Yeah. Pretty sure some people have just taken like dinosaur skulls and just blown through them to see what noise they make. <laughs> yeah, but that's not like that's solid science. <laughs> I mean, you could take a T-Rex skull that's, like, bigger than, like, a car and just, like, blow into it, and it wouldn't do jack. Well, there's, like, they did acoustical analyses of this. There was this one dinosaur that they know for sure created its call by, like, reverberating sound through its skull, and they did, like, an acoustic analysis of what sound waves would sound like through that skull. So there's a, I'm pretty sure there's at least one dinosaur where we know what it sounded like. Oh, right, or at least have, like, a pretty good idea. Yeah. Science is pretty cool like that. You can you can figure that out, generally. Anyway, the Doctor and Co. eventually find this control room. The Doctor's like hacking into it, and he's like, we're going to do some stuff. He contacts the Indian Space Agency, and he's like, look, I've got the ship under control. You can, t- you can take away the missiles now. And she's like, nope, too late. We already launched them. <laughs> I'm like, you don't, you don't have a self-destruct? You- she, didn't, she actually says, no, we're going to launch them. Well, she, she says, I think, like, well, yeah, I think she says they're locked on already. Uh, and it's like, wait, really? You, you, she's like taunting him. Says, I'm going to do it, doctor. I'm going to do it. Just you watch me. <laughs> well, apparently as soon as the, the missiles <laughs> lock on, you can't even abort the launch because. I, I thought she was like, yeah, yeah, I guess she hadn't already launched them. I, I don't know. Yeah, don't but remember. she said they're locked on, which she repeats again later when the ship turns around. And she's like, well, it doesn't matter. The, sh- the, the missiles are locked on. I'm like, you really don't have a self-destruct, do you? You, the fact that the ship is now flying away and is no longer a threat doesn't... You don't want to, like, destroy the, the missiles now? Also, the fact that the missiles are apparently, like, faster than the spaceship, which is kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> but not faster than Solomon's spaceship. So, weird. Yeah, no, well, his... We'll, we'll get there. Well, the Doctor his, disables his engines, but that's why Solomon's, like... I'll let you live because because his ship is quicker. So he's like, I can just leave and you guys will get blown up when he, when the missiles. Because right now, because the doctor told him there were missiles and he thought the doctor was bluffing. But right now he comes in, he's like, so you were right, doctor. There are missiles, and the doctor's like, yeah, there are. And he's like, my ship can outrun them, but the ship can't. So give me Nefertiti and I'll let you well, live. Maybe he was just lying, you know? <laughs> Who knows? Bluffing his way through. I mean, considering he wants to take Nefertiti and leave. Yeah, no, I mean, I don't know. He's like, give me Nefertiti and I'll let you live. And the doctor's like, yeah, no. And that's when they run away on the Triceratops. But Nefertiti gives herself up anyway. Yeah. Uh, and originally she was going to die in this. She was going to give herself up to save them to Solomon. And then Moffat was like, too close to all the other self-sacrificial things I've done in my two seasons that I, is a plot line I really like to reuse. So you shouldn't do that, Chibnall. He's like, all right, 
well, I'll just find another way to end this <laughs> the story. And I think it would have been kind of too cheesy. She died to Solomon. Plus, we get this really dark really moment from the doctor just all. brutally murdering Solomon. Right. So, because they enact this plan. Yeah, they need and, two people from the same genetic line the yeah, to, yeah, pilot to, the ship. to pilot the ship. And the doctor said, like, we don't have two people from the same genetic line. And Brian's like, uh, yes, we do. I'm literally Rory's dad. And the doctor's like, oh, good point. So they pilot the ship. Meanwhile, the doctor... Like, kind of just looks like they're sitting in the chairs having seizures, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, because Solomon's ship's disconnect- looks cool. disconnected at this point. And Amy and Riddell kind of tase the dinosaurs to keep them out of the control room while Brian and Roy pilot the spaceship, and the Doctor teleports over to Solomon's ship with the Silurian transponder, which is what the missiles have locked onto. And he leaves it there, and he's like, look, uh, I'm taking Nefertiti, and the missiles are going to lock onto your ship now. I'm going to disable your engines, and you're going to die. And he's like, no, Doctor, please. You can't do this. What do you want? I can get you literally anything in the universe. And the Doctor's like, well, no. And he leaves. Yeah. And this is another yeah. one of those moments where the Eleventh Doctor is like, really, really, really just dark. And yeah. I mean, yeah, this is kind of an overreaction almost on this part. I mean, there are people who have done way worse than Solomon did, and they kind of get off <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> way better. Whereas Solomon here just gets just 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 gets just blown up. And I guess because the doctor's like, well, Solomon killed all the Silurians, right? But, at the, I mean, at the same time... Well, he, I mean, he has that line, like, did the Silurians beg when you killed them? But at the same time, the doctor's supposed to be better than that, right? <laughs> like, Well, not the 11th doctor. And you're thinking of 1 through 10? Gotta remember that this is 11. Ah, uh, yes, the seventh doctor who manipulates a Dalek into killing itself. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so that's the end of that. Still, though, I think it's really like... It, again, it's one of those moments that I guess maybe people overlook when they're like, well, the seventh doctor is just so happy-go-lucky. And it's like, he literally just murdered a dude. Yeah, maybe. Th- no, that's no, like I what mean, he like, did. Is like, he just killed this dude yeah. straight up. No, I mean, it stands out as like, wow, he just did that. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't really have any other reaction to it other than that because again, I think the story is pretty mediocre or like less below average. But yeah, I, I mean, I agree with with that. There's this nice little character development where Brian, when he first steps out, the reason why he's like so shell shocked by the spaceship is that he hates traveling. But then at the end of the story, he asks the doctor if he can see Earth from space. And then he goes on all these travels to all these places around Earth. And he visits Siluria, where the dinosaurs are with the doctor. Yeah, that scene was cool with, with uh, him you know, him eating the sandwich and sitting outside the TARDIS or whatever. And also him traveling now. Like, yeah. kind of character development. He's a pensioner, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Nefertiti winds up with Riddell, with Riddell. In the African wilderness in 1902, I guess. <laughs> I guess they're flirting evolved into something more than flirting yeah just a strange, kind of don't want to think just, about that I mean, any more than that it's just like a strange decision to even have them and just a strange decision to 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 have this be the case i don't know it's just yeah but i mean it's, it's like just cut to, those two not, characters out honestly e- yeah cut. cut them out but not to like i guess defend this kind of questionable decision too much you know Moffat was like well you can't do the self-sacrificing thing because I do that literally all the time and <laughs> he can't dump Nefertiti back because the whole reason he included it was her was because she disappeared so yeah it, it, in a way I can see how Chibnall was like well shoot what am I gonna do with her at right. the end of the story yeah and I guess I'll just leave her with Riddell I guess he could have had her travel with the doctor to somewhere else and her he he dump her somewhere else but, I mean, this is just the, the time constraint, the easiest, yeah, I'm, quickest, I, I'm lowest just, budget. I'm just concerned about, like, I don't know, just what were these two characters doing in this story? I mean, we skipped the Velociraptors part. Did they, we? Yeah. There was Amy and Riddell. Oh. You know, Amy sort of no, talks some well, more smack to Riddell, and, and they go we, and tase the Velociraptors. We brushed over it where they were, sh- they were defending the dinosaurs from coming into the control room. But yeah, they're tasing them. There's, yeah, there's also the silly banter where Adele hands her a gun. He's like, this is a gun. He's like, stun bullets. She's like, ah, 
He's like, the doctor would almost be proud. Well, there's also the one I thought was uh, not funny, but at least slightly like funnier, but was um, Riddell was like, this is a two-man job. And Amy's like, Amy grabs a gun. gun. He's like, what are you doing? Just like, I'm easily worth two men. You can come along too. (laughs) Turns out she needed him because he saves her back at least once during that gunfight. So... (laughs) Although he needed her way more. So she, I'm pretty sure she tased way more dinosaurs than he did. Pretty bad yeah, so, big game hunter. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, I mean, I don't know. There's, I think it's, it's it, you know, hunting a, a single animal and stalking it or whatever is different than, like, having a bunch of velociraptors jumping at you. All right, but, fair. But, so what dinosaurs are actually in this? There's, there's, there's the T-Rex, there's the T-Rex, Velociraptor, Stegosaurus. Triceratops. Ter- yeah, Pterodon, Triceratops, and that's it. I think that's it. it. Basically, the most famous really, ones. Really missed opportunity. I, this so is probably budgetary. No, like plesiosaur. Oh. In the in the ocean. <sighs> I guess. Yeah, why not? Or, or you know, Carnotaur. Maybe some prehistoric sharks. You know why not? Yeah. Could've why thrown, not? Like Budget. I don't know. Godzilla in the <laughs> Godzilla. <laughs> My favorite dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> Is Godzilla even a dinosaur? No, no. <laughs> Godzilla is like a... He's like a radioactive like lizard or something. This is something that was exposed to radiation. Or, I don't know. Isn't he like, a, was like part yeah. of a race of beings that were yeah, like... Yeah, he was like, like from King within Ghidorah the earth or something. Mothra. Mothra is the coolest. They're releasing a movie with King Ghidorah and Mothra <laughs> in this year. Fighting Godzilla. And it looks awesome, but it also looks really bad. But it looks wow. awesome. No King Kong. No watch. Well, they are Whatever. leading up to a King Kong versus Godzilla movie in 2020, I think. I mean, there are already like a bunch. There's at least one. There's at least one. one. They're doing another one. Because <laughs> cinematic universes are a thing now. So if you didn't know, Kong Skull Island in that 20, 2015, 16 Godzilla, Godzilla movie. Really? Are in the same universe. Yeah. Huh. And the Godzilla wow. movie this year with Mafu and, and King Ghidorah is a sequel to that Godzilla <laughs> movie. And it's the next stage in the, the cinematic universe. Who keeps yeah, watching yeah. These Kong, movies? Kong Skull Island has a post credit scene that reveals Mothra, so if I remember correctly. Wow. I mean, not something that I would think modern audiences would care about, but, you know, just goes to show you. People love Godzilla, okay? <laughs> Everybody turns out for Godzilla. <laughs> anyway, back to this. Just an all right story. And that's kind of the theme for the season, I think. Although, if I had wow, to choose great. between this and Asylum of the Daleks, I'd choose this. If I yeah, had to rewatch choose, one. Yeah, this held my attention more than Asylum, at least. The next story looks pretty good. <laughs> uh, I mean, I honestly think this, up, this like, season gets completely shafted by a lot of factors. One, I think Moffat burned himself out in his first two seasons, so he's kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel for a little while here. Well, it seems to be a trend is like, all right, Rose stuck stuck around for a little too long. I mean, Rory stuck around for a little too long. Yeah, uh, I think just budgetary constraints. I think splitting the season in two hurt it a lot. It was just a, a perfect storm to just really kind of <laughs> beat this season down, kind of. But it's okay. Yeah, we'll get through it. There are some stories this season that I'm looking forward to. So that's good, at least. <laughs> I mean, yeah. this episode kind of reminded me of the Space Pirates. I know there's like that. This, oh, God, there's, well, there's, that's a reference. No, there's like this, not a meme, but there's this, just this like idea is like, how can this story called the Space Pirates be as lame as, as the as Space Pirates is? Yeah. And like dinosaurs on a spaceship sounds real cool. You know, there's dinosaurs in it. Mm-hmm. Real first Doctor Who story of the new era to focus on dinosaurs in a big way. Because we had Invasion of the, uh, was that what it's called? Invasion, invasion of the, of the dinosaurs. dinosaurs, yep. Yeah. It's the one where Yates turned on unit. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Uh, Freaking Yates. Like, I don't know. It was just the dinosaurs felt underutilized. And. Yeah, they they weren't so much as a character as a plot point in the story, really. Yeah. And I don't know. I want to touch on a few things with the dinosaurs. We see the the T-Rex sleeping on its side. And I was like, what? Like that? No, no, that's no. So I looked it up. I was like, how did I looked up how dinosaurs slept? And there's. Do we know no, how dinosaurs sleep? There, I mean, there wasn't too much of a, you know, between paleontologists, there, are, there isn't like one singular consensus or whatever, but um, a lot of people seem to think they slept kind of like birds, like kind of... Standing up. Either standing up or like 
uh, like chickens, like sort of scrunched up mm -hmm. and, and kneeling almost. Um, but a, lo a lot of sources also said, you know, we can't rule out sleeping on their sides. So Yeah. In the absence of further evidence, like, you know, I mean, yeah, there, there's it's possible one... that that dinosaur got tased and just fell over, right? Yeah, the well, velociraptors I mean, get tased. Sure. And... But it was sl it was snoring, like, and who knows, like, if, if that's how dinosaurs actually slept. But, yeah, but I mean, if you, like, but what I'm saying is, like, maybe that he got tased and, and f like, he, he fainted or yeah. something. So, yeah, he no. You know, I mean, but the, the indication of, like, what we see on screen is, like, it's a sleeping, snoring dinosaur. And, like, it's fine. You don't have to be, like, true to life. And, and really, how can you when you're dealing with dinosaurs? But. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. There was this one, the the big indication for like the sleeping standing up thing was this dinosaur. Uh, I forget what it was name. It was it was discovered in China and has a Chinese name that translates to uh, sleeping dragon. But they think that it it was preserved sleeping, but also standing up. So mm -hmm. that's like a big indication for the sleeping standing up thing. Uh, yeah. Just really I don't know if we can though. really they, know though. They they um, it didn't bother me. They uh, yeah, I mean it didn't bother me either. Well, yeah, it bothered me a little bit. Enough to, like, look it up. But we also have the Triceratops um, eyes, mm -hmm. which were included to endear the character more to the audience. Uh, that one was fine always again. Thing. Yeah, no, I mean, like... Because they kind of they're, they're personify it yeah, as a they dog, anthrop so... They anthropomorphize these, these um, dinosaurs. Plus, who knows? Maybe they went through some genetic changes over the thousands of years they've been sitting on the spaceship, right? Maybe, yeah. Why didn't they evolve to withstand tasers? Because <laughs> no one was tasing them on a constant basis. That's not an excuse. Yeah. I didn't. What? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, hold them to that. What? Yeah. All Lazy right. dinosaurs. <laughs> it's not like the That's dinosaurs control must be evolution. Why they went extinct? It's not like they control evolution. It's not like I can be like, well, my kid's gonna have skin wow. made of steel. You can't do that. It sucks to well, be can you. Can you? Yep. I'd like to see you try. <laughs> Call me up in 20 years when you have a kid <laughs> and he has scaly steel skin like you're claiming you can do. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, I, I don't have anything else to say on the story no, like at neither all. neither do I. <laughs> well, on that note, you can reach us at the thedoctordecadivegetable.com. Questions, comments, concerns, angry rants, love letters, your thoughts on dinosaurs. Your favorite dinosaur-related thing. Don't say Godzilla. <laughs> you can find us on YouTube at Decade of Vegetable. You can find us on Apple Podcasts and Google Play at Trust Your Doctor. Be sure to leave a rating if you like the show. Check us out on Facebook, Trust Your Doctor. Like us on Facebook. Also check us out on Twitter at TYD Podcast. And follow us on Twitter next time for watching A Town Called Mercy. But until then, the end. The end.